All right, yeah, uh, thank you uh, for the intro, and yeah, thank you everyone for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so I'm going to talk about something that's completely different um, and has nothing to do with cancer, except that I will mention that there's um, some really interesting work on using poliovirus to do uh, as oncolytic uh, treatment for brain cancer. So if, you, if I catch any of your attention on evolution of poliovirus, you can then read about the possibility of using it to cure brain cancers of certain types. Um, but uh, yeah, so the title, what I'm going to talk to you today is about evolution, a story about evolutionary epidemiology um, of a virus that is, you know, has historically been one of the motivators for much of the innovations in public health in the 20th century um, and is one of the most um, cost driving things in global health in the 21st century as we try to successfully eradicate it. Um, and associated with that is some interesting evolutionary problems that I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, but maybe first, uh, just a, a quick overview of um, po where polio is at in the world today, because I suspect most people in this room don't think about it too much. I know six years ago, I certainly didn't. Um, so in 1988, which is when the Polio Eradication Initiative, um, which is this uh, consortium that is partnered with the WHO and US CDC and UNICEF and the Rotary Club and um, said, got 150 something countries to say, hey, we, we haven't already eliminated polio from our countries, but we really think we can eradicate it from the globe. Um, and that's sort of the milestone mo moment that we look at. So in 1988, there were about a thousand cases of polio per day. Um, that is mostly children waking up one morning and beginning to become paralyzed in a limb or, or worse. Um, through the eradication effort, which has been driven mainly by vaccination, um, that's down to about three cases per month. Um, when we talk about polio eradication, we're actually talking about three um, distinct viruses, serologically distinct viruses. Um, wild polio virus type 2 it was eradicated from the natural environment in 1999, hasn't been seen transmitting since. Um, Wild virus type 3, which is the types are defined as being, you know, serologically distinct. They're not, immunity to one confers almost no immunity to the other, um, has almost certainly been eradicated. It was last seen in 2012 um, in, in, in nature and hasn't been seen since. Um, and type 1 wild poliovirus is, is the one that is still known to persist and is, and is uh, one of the two major things that the program is dealing with, and that's um, known to persist in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and this slide's a little out of date, um, and may or may not still persist in Nigeria and part of the country that Boko Haram controls and surveillance is not uh, reliable. Um, that was the last place it was seen. Um, the tools for fighting it, are there, there are two types of vaccines. Um, there's an oral vaccine, which is a, what we call a live attenuated vaccine, as is a, it's an infectious virus. It's just one whose um, virulence is very, very low. Um, that's what makes it a good vaccine. Um, and then there's also an inactivated vaccine, which um, you know, is an injectable, non-replicating you know, source of antigen. Um, we'll be talking a bunch today about the oral polio vaccine. Um, but yeah, so we're, as an eradication program, the question is, have we actually solved the problem? And, and part of what today's talk is about is it's actually, even though we have two tools and we have had huge success, um, it's tricky. Um, so. OPV, this live vaccine, um, is very effective against polio transmission. Um, it provokes immunity in the intestines, which is the primary site of application. It substantially reduces the probability of fecal oral transmission. Um, I don't know if anyone was in my talk earlier today that adds a bunch of nuance to that story, but that's the first approximation. Um, but it does come with a non-negligible risk of serious adverse events. Right? So what the serious adverse event is, is polio. Um, <laughs> right? um, and so the, the, the deal is, is um, wild polio virus, specifically type 1, um, or does either one, any of them, um, while I talked about cases of paralysis, most people don't know they're sick. Um, you get, so like it's between 1 in 200 and 1 in 2,000, depending on the serotype, of unimmunized people who get infected actually become paralyzed. Um, and so, but it's so highly infectious that prior to vaccination, most people in the world got polio when they were children. Um, and it's only because of the uh, case to infection ratios being the way they are that not most people didn't know that. Um, but so OPV, um, compare one in a thousand as an order of magnitude 
to something like one in 500,000 um, as the chance of getting a paralysis from a direct, direct dose of OPV, your first e exposure. Um, so for the vast, uh, you know, for the last 60 years, that was a great deal. You had this disease you were definitely going to get um, that you could replace by a 10,000-fold you know, 10, safer um, first exposure that would then future, prevent all future disease. Um, the catch, though, with an eradication program um, is that the risk of getting a natural infection is now so low that that, and the number of people you're vaccinating is so high that they're actually now a comparable source of risk. Um, and so part of the game is, is trying to figure out right now is how to stop using OPV. Um, given that IPV, the other vaccine, this is Jonas Salk's famous vaccine, has essentially no risk of serious adverse events. I mean, you see best estimates are of order one in 20 million, and, and they're probably to the, you know, the things that are in the vaccine and not the antigen itself. Um, but it's, it's more expensive, which matters in a donor-driven public health effort. Um, there's also currently a, a serious supply shortage, so global demand cannot be met by current global manufacturing capacity. Um, that will hopefully be getting better over the next few years, but it's currently a serious problem. But more importantly, it, it's also much less effective against transmission. Um, IPV protects you from paralysis really nicely, um, but it does not protect somebody else from you silently having a large infection and excreting a bunch of virus and giving it to somebody else. Um, and so when you don't have universal vaccination, um, you don't get good herd immunity from IPV in most settings. And, Again, if you were at my earlier talk, there's a lot of nuance to that, but that's the gist. Um, and so when we talk about polio eradication, um, we're talking about all polio virus eradication, which includes OP OPV, but OPV is the tool that we actually have to eradicate polio virus. Um, and so it's complicated. Um, and so I want to talk to you about that, that one in 500,000, or actually I'll give you another number that's more specific um, for a different part of the process, one in 100 million. Um, we want to look at how does that happen? How does this vaccine that is, you know, almost avirulent become a public health concern in certain contexts? Um, and so when I mentioned the 1 in 500,000 number, that's if I give you a vaccine for the first time. Um, another phenomenon that happens that is in more troubling for the eradication program, but probably still less troubling from a global disease point of view, is what's called circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus. Um, this is where the vaccine actually doesn't just infect the person you gave it, but you can transmit it to other people. That happens fairly often, but usually it's also avirulent. But roughly one in every 100 million doses that have been given out in the last 20 years, um, that's led to an outbreak that circulates and is phenotypically similar to wild poliovirus. Um, and that part, the phenotypically similar part, is an evolutionary process that we'll talk about. Um, there's another type of... Um, unusual event, evolutionary event um, that happens with immunocompromised people who receive polio vaccine. Um, so these are B, various kinds of B cell deficiencies and something called severe combined um, immune disorder and X-linked A-gamma globa, uh, A -gamma -globa -mania. I'm at, um not my specialty. Um, but all of these things are things that prevent people from being as effective at clearing a polio infection, and, and in rare cases, probably, again, of order one per hundred million, maybe even less, they can excrete polio for years. Um, there's a guy who lives in England who's been doing it for 30 years and shows no signs of stopping. Um, contrast that with the average infection in a normal person is a month. Um, and so there's a question of what risk do these people play to the eradication program if they're, you know, around. Um, and then also with this is if you had a new vaccine that had different evolutionary dynamics, you know, how would you generalize from what we've seen with the current one to what would happen with the new one? And I also personally think that this is a really interesting model system that we still have access to before eradication happens, and we have decades of data about um, to study evolutionary epidemiology more generally. Um, and so that's my other way of saying, you know, if you don't want to talk about polio, some of the, the things we talk about today happen with other organisms for sure. Um, you know, Ebola was an example of, you know, we don't know how it gets out of its animal reservoir. We don't even properly know what the animal reservoir is. Um, but we know that in the last outbreak, um, at one point fairly early in the outbreak, a single point mutation changed an amino acid that two research groups were able to demonstrate independently, um, improved the virus's ability to infect human dendritic cells and actually decreased its ability to infect bat dendritic cells. And so it's a clear human-directed host adaptation that happens, and that kind of a, a event is something that we will see in the polio vaccine story. I'll also interrupt me with questions if you've got them. Um, 
I'm happy to, to do that. But so a little uh, primer on poliovirus. Um, so one way to think about poliovirus, if I can find the mouse, yeah, forget about it, um, is it's a big molecule with a life cycle. Um, that's the thing on the right. Um, sphere, bunch of proteins um, assembled together. Genomically, I think what we're more interested in is it's a it's it's a single-stranded RNA virus. Um, it's whole the entire length of the thing is 7,440 bases long, so it's small. Um, the part in the middle that says P1, P2, P3, that's the the protein coding region. It actually has a single polyprotein that it codes for, one open reading frame, um, and that thing. Uh, transcribes and translates, translates, I always get those backwards, translates, and actually then cleaves itself into various pieces over time that eventually self-assemble. Um, the P1 region is the capsid. Those are the proteins that are actually the physical structure of an assembled virus. P2 and P3 are all the machinery needed to make that uh, virus. Um, and then the five prime end, um, the non-NTR non-translated region, is where the ribosome binds. Um, and it's really important to the replicative fitness of the virus. It has all sorts of cool secondary structure of the single strand of RNA folding on itself and making base pairs and so on. Um, when it uh, translates, it makes errors very reliably. It has very little error, um, error correction mechanism, I mean, no known error correction mechanisms. Um, and so it basically makes one error per strand. Um, every time it makes a copy, it makes a mistake somewhere on average. Um, and yet at the same time, even though there's that really high mutation rate, um, it, there's a lot of conserved structure and function. Um, and so what, we're, what we see there, as we'll talk about more, is the interaction between the fitness in the ecological environment that the virus is experiencing in the host with the ability to generate change um, when, at every generation of, of translation. So that's the virus. I want to give you a cartoon description of the different phenotypes in people um, that, ex that you experience with polio infection. And I'm emphasizing in people because this is not necessarily the phenotypes in cell culture. It's not necessarily the phenotypes in monkeys. It's not in mice. Um, Vincent Racaniello, who uh, is an old polio virologist who wrote a wonderful podcast called This Week in Virology, if anyone's interested in that topic. There's also This Week in Microbiology, and so I'm a big fan. Um, we'll say that you know mice lie and monkeys exaggerate, um, and that's true for polio. Um, but so the three phenotypic axes that I'm interested in are transmission and virulence. Um, so virulence is how likely it is to cause paralysis in this case. Um, transmission is how easy it is to pass from person to person. Um, and then there's also, you know, virulence on the repeated, but the within host fitness, um, which is a kind of vague term that I mean, how good is the virus at staying in a single person? Um, so as distinct from passing from person to person, it's from staying within a single host once an infection has started. Um, and I'll try to give a rational a run for acronyms. Um, there's fewer of them, but they all sound the same. Um, but so the first one is wild poliovirus, WPV. This is the naturally occurring thing. Um, it is high virulence, high transmission, and it's pretty good at persisting within a host for, you know, 45 days on average, but it could be three months, four months. Um, and that's sort of our, one of our reference points. So the next thing is the vaccine, um, oral polio vaccine. I called it Sabin here after Albert Sabin, who's the guy who gets credit for it. Um, and we talk, we refer to these generally as the Sabin strains as distinct from possibly other vaccine strains that were either once were considered or may future be. Um, what makes it a vaccine is it is much, much less virulent. Oh, oh, whoa, I leaned. Uh, yeah, much, much, much less virulent um, as we talked about it. It is still transmissible, but also less transmissible. Um, and it's both less infectious if you do a dose response experiment, and it doesn't persist in the host as long. Its, it's shedding duration is lower. And so in all ways, it's been weakened, and that's what made it a vaccine. Um, the next class of things that are, once you put the vaccine into people, is where the cascade of the next four categories come from. Uh, the first category are what, the, what we call in polio Sabin-like viruses. That means viruses that look like the Sabin vaccine in terms of their antigenic content and, as we'll see, genomically are, with, are not very evolved genetically from the reference strain that is the vaccine. Um, 
basically phenotypically, they're not terribly distinct from the vaccine itself. That's kind of what makes them Sabin-like historically. Um, then we talked about the circulating vaccine derived, the CVDPV. These are, to a first approximation, these are wild poliovirus reborn. Um, they have, they don't all have, as we'll talk about, there's a continuum of phenotype, but what fundamentally makes something a CVDPV um, is it's somehow regained most of the wild phenotype um, and just has to be treated like a public health problem of similar severity. Um, we talked about these immunocompromised shedders and particularly the virus that they shed called the IVDPV as an immunocompromised vaccine derived poliovirus. Um, the, as, and I, as the interesting thing about immunocompromised shedders that you need to remember for this talk um, is that they are as virulent as the wild and circulating vaccine-derived polyviruses. When you do all the assays about how likely they are to cause paralysis, they are usually quite high. Um, on the other hand, unlike the circulating strains, the examples we have of immunocompromised shedders have very rarely ever been shown to transmit to other people. Um, and the couple examples where they have transmitted to other people, it was only immediate family members and both times were in what are known as consanguinous populations, as in there's a lot of close cousin marriage. So it's also not a large representative population. Um, and related potentially to that is that they're on this axis, they're within host fitness, as I mentioned earlier, is potentially much, much higher. You know, 30 years is an exception, that, but the average immunocompromised shedder that we know about sheds for more than a year before they spontaneously stop. Um, and compare that to 30 days for a typical Sabin-like infection. And so there, these things within that unusual human host um, are substantially better at persisting in that human host and are plausibly from the epidemiology not as good at transmitting. Um, and maybe the last thing that will come up on some of the figures but is probably not that important for this group is there's a set of things called ambiguous vaccine-derived polioviruses. That's an epidemiological category which says we found a virus, it has genetic features of it's not Sabin-like anymore, but we can't really tell what it is. We found it in the sewer, we found it once, but it's, it's something that was from the field. Um, so their phenotypes are in general all over the place and most of the time we probably don't know. No. Cool. So the contrast I'll be drawing in this talk, and it'll be sequence data in a moment, um, is mainly between vaccine, circulating, and immunocompromised. So those are the categories to think about, and think about those different axes as you go through the rest of the talk. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know if this audience needs this, but the, the genotypes, um, you know, here's just the snapshot of a multiple alignment. Um, on the nucleotide side, you get a fair amount of variation from virus to virus. Um, there's quite a bit more conserved structure when you translate that to amino acids. Um, generally, the you know, synonymous mutations are generally more common, but we'll, and we'll talk more about that in detail uh, in a couple slides. Um, in terms of the vocabulary I'm going to use, there's lots of different things that evolve in lots of different ways with lots of different mechanisms. For poliovirus, the most important ones are sub uh, synonymous substitutions. Um, Non-synonymous substitutions, those are both point mutations, the non-synonymous being the ones that change the amino acid that it codes for. Um, reversion is a specific term for vaccine polio. It said, there, as we'll talk about in a moment, there are specific markers that go directly from this is a wild virus to this looks like a vaccine virus. And reversion is when the vaccine goes back to the wild in a direct way as opposed to some, it found a phenotype in a different way. It's, no, I took a point mutation and I reversed it. Um, and I actually suspect I'm missing a figure. But, oh, it's coming up in the next slide. Um, and then recombination is another important pr uh, property, um, particularly recombination with enteroviruses that aren't polio. And I'll talk about that later if there's time. Um, so one of my favorite things that I learned a few, when I got into this field um, is how did we get oral polio vaccine back in the 50s um, when we didn't really know much about molecular genetics? Um, and so what I'm showing over here is a figure from a paper that talks about the history of a few different vaccines. And since I can't seem to find the mouse, um, What's going on here is on the top are two naturally occurring human poliovirus strains um, that were isolated at some point in the 1940s. Um, on the bottom, oh, I'm moving the wrong mouse, that'll do it, okay. Um, 
And so these are wild polioviruses, you know, frozen in amber in 1940, um, give or take. On the bottom are three different vaccine strains um, and a mouse adapted strain over here that we don't need to talk about. Um, but the process of generating vaccines from wild virus that they did for the live vaccine was a bunch of empirical serial passage experiments in non-human hosts. Um, so we used evolution to, to, to our advantage. If you take, uh, particularly for the Sabin vaccine, which is the one that we use today, um, what a number of people and eventually from this point on Albert Sabin did, um, were passage it through monkeys. I, for, I think uh, green vervet monkeys, I think was the species at the time. Um, when you, you have to, in order to get a monkey infected with human poliovirus, you have to give them a very large dose. It's, it's not a naturally susceptible um, population. Um, but whatever that, if you give them a large enough dose that they do infect, the things that, you, that they excrete, because this virus makes errors all the time, are likely to be slightly more adapted to that host than they were to humans. So you do this 14 times, you passage from one monkey to the next and so on, and you start to get a virus that's better at monkeys. At that point, you can switch from the, the animal system to the cell line system, that's monkey kidney tissue. Um, you can continue to do this both in vitro and in vivo. In case of type one vaccine, which is the one that was the, had the most work done on it, you know, I don't know this is of order 60 times, I, I never added it up. Um, you end up with a virus that is now very well adapted to monkey kidney cells um, that is no longer very well adapted to humans. Um, and that's how we made the vaccine. Um, and so we tested that by you know, t showing that the virulence has, at this point, after lots of cell culturing, it's actually no longer a very good monkey virus either. It's really a monkey kidney virus at that point. And so it's pretty safe to give it to monkeys and it's very safe to give it to humans. Um, and just for the history, you know, something I don't understand, but I think is fascinating to think about is this was the vaccine that proved to be the safest. These other ones all roughly started at the same place, possibly with another thing mixed in, but they were, they weren't as systematic in how they went about doing it. It's like, so we started in monkeys, then we jumped into mice for a while, then we jumped into chicken eggs, then we jumped back into monkeys, then we jumped into humans for a while, which in hindsight was probably a mistake, and then ended up with, uh, you know, something else that was still, again, attenuated compared to the wild naturally occurring virus, but was proved not to be as good of a candidate for a vaccine. Um, what we learn in the 80s, um, 30 years, 20, 30 years later, is what actually did we do? Um, and what's, what's shown here for the three different types of polioviruses is the point mutations that were shown to be the, the strong predictors of the change in the par paralytic phenotype. Right? Um, so if you have had one of the changes in these positions, or if you've had the changes in these positions, you go from a virulent natural poliovirus to something that is much, much less virulent. Um, these, are, these are the attenuation markers in poliovirus. And I think the thing I want you guys to take away is that there's not many of them. You know, type one has, you know, six um, changes that we know are correlated with attenuation. There's probably 58 changes, I think, total, um, that's half, you know, half of which are synonymous and probably don't make much of a difference. Um, some of which probably do make some difference for the stuff we'll be talking about, but we don't know what they do. Um, but then there's really only a couple. Um, and one of the things that was really interesting is the Sabin strains, all three of them had an important change in this uh, ribosome binding area. Um, and that's one of the, that seems to be a key determinant of replicative fitness. And so at least even in vitro replicative fitness is definitely something to do with the human phenotype. Um, and so that's uh, an interesting thing. So the catch is, as we talked about with the CVDPV thing, I think this is a really weird zoonosis. Um, the vaccine is this, you know, this 33 degrees Celsius monkey kidney virus that's been you know, kept at the same genotype for 60 years, but given out to billions and billions of times. Um, every once in a while, it transmits from person to person enough times that you run that experimental evolution experiment back in reverse. Um, and you end up with something resembling a wild polio virus. Um, and, you know, and so that's the, the challenge that we're striking with. But I, I do think this is an interesting model system for zoonosis in the sense that it's a non-human adapted virus with lots of exposure that occasionally is able to find its way back. Um, so I think the things that we can learn from it are potentially more generally useful. Um, all right, so it's a bioinformatics talk. We get to some phylogenies now. Um, so 
Well, the rest of what I'll be showing you today is data that's been pulled from GenBank, um, possibly with a lot of irritating work of annotating it with proper epidemiological information, which Will and his work on the anthologies would tell you that has been a, a difficult problem to get data sorted that way. Um, but particularly what's going on here in these phylogenies, I'm showing you um, whole genome amino acid trees. So I'm taking the, you know, the protein, that polyprotein that's been coded for, and I'm putting them in order um, in phy you know, phylogenetic relationships among their amino acids, um, where I've rooted it to the vaccine as the reference strain at the root. Um, and then you have vaccine, we have Sabin-like viruses that are, as you can see on the tree, closely related to the vaccine. In purple, we have various immunocompromised cheddars, which are viruses that have diverged from the Sabin-like population, but mostly within immunocompromised people. This is one of those examples where there was a little bit of transmission to a family member. Um, and then we've, in red, we have the circulating vaccine-derived strains, um, multiple examples up here. And in black, we have actual wild polioviruses. Um, and there's a couple other reference strains scattered about in the middle I might talk about, depending on how it goes. Um, the key point, and then, and then also over here, we have a similar story for type 2, which is, you know, genetically distinct. Um, these are many tests of convergent evolution. And so what, I'm, what I've colored here is by paper. Um, so there's not a, a perfect one-to-one -one relationship between paper and completely independent event um, from a vaccine evolution point of view, but it's close. Um, and so the idea is that while you have clades that are structured in phenotype color, they're not structured in actually how they came to be. Not structured in space, they're not structured in time. Um, and so these are examples of convergent evolution in many cases. Um, you know, these clusters of, of circulating strains, some of them are from the Philippines, some of them are from Haiti. Um, you know, they're from different points in time. Um, you know, this is one immunocompromised person, this is another, this is a third, this is a fourth, this is a fifth, different people living at different times. And so it really is a convergent evolution data set that we get to study these different parts. And I think the key thing that just even at this point we can see um, is that there's some sense in the genetics. The circulating, so as you move from vaccine up towards the wild direction, you know, you have a backbone of evolution that, and particularly have a moment here where everything that's highly virulent is segregated from everything that's vaccine-like. And so that's some of the genetic change that we're seeing that contributes to the virulence phenotype. But then you've also got the immunocompromised people tend to take their own journeys from this space, um, whereas the, the, the largest circulating outbreaks have all found a relatively similar space that is not identical to the wild poliovirus space, but is closest to related to it. Um, and it's then interesting to think about what, what are these smaller ones that are kind of, they were circulating, but they weren't big and they were easy to stop. And actually, were they full phenotype? Programmatically, in the eradication program, we think of them as equivalent phenotypes, but maybe they weren't. And you contrast that with the type 2, which is the bigger problem of circulating virus, is that you know, in type 1, the wild virus and the circulating virus still form separate clades. So they're maybe not indistinguishable. But in type 2, we have fewer examples of wild virus that have had whole genome sequencing published. But it clusters in the middle of a bunch of stuff. Um, and so these are, you know, bioinformatically, you're inclined to think, the, you know, the, what we're converging to in type 2 is really indistinguishable from what we're converging to, from what the wild type was. Whereas in type 1, maybe not. And that's interesting because it fits with the epidemiology. Circulating type 2 is a bigger problem than circulating type 1. And so something about that evolutionary process is a bit different. Um, and so I want to then drill in on a couple different parts of this tree and talk more detail what's going on. Um, so first, just focusing on the save and light part of the story. Right? And this is, where, what, this is something that's well understood. And I'm showing, you know, uh, gratuitously figures from a paper of mine, but I could have picked many other papers from many other people that have built up this case. Um, so I can't take credit for this in a, this particular idea very much. Um, but in those Sabin-like viruses that have only had a couple of amino acid changes on average, many of which have had zero amino acid changes on average, we can estimate how, when people are shedding it in their stool, how quickly do these changes happen? Um, the scale here is, is, I should have rewritten for a talk, but 10 to the minus 1 per day is a change every 10 days. So on average, a mutation will appear de novo and fix within the host in 10 days. 
Um, 10 to the minus 2 is it takes on average 100 days. Since most people don't shed for 100 days, what that really means is that a fraction of them become positive at a plus own rate of 100 days. Um, but um, the key thing here is that in the, you know, in type 2, both of the markers that we know are directly responsible for neurovirulence reversion are also very quick to revert. Um, and so you get, you regain a lot of the wild phenotype for paralysis pretty quickly with type 2. With type 1, you have a mix. Um, some places revert very quickly. Others, um, in the data set we had, we had no power to detect any reversion at all. Um, and so that says, that, you know, something, and, but the infections on these, level, on these two different strains look the same. Um, so that's one of the first pieces of evidence that the phenotype of paralysis and the phenotype of, of, of shedding a virus are not necessarily the same. Um, and then that's a teaser for later. Um, so, yeah, so while reversion of virulence markers often happens quickly, as we talked about on the tree, what else is going on? Um, so this is where now I get to some stuff that's surprising for anyone who's, um, who's thought about, you know, um, pathogen evolution before. Um, so one quantity that I think people think about is, is this thing called the DNDS, um, maybe omega. It's the ratio of non-synonymous changes to synonymous changes along a, along a phylogeny. Um, nodding of heads, people thought about the NDS much before? Okay, yeah, it's okay, it's a decent amount of head nodding. So the sort of this, this so first I'll show you the data, then I'll give you the interpretation. So the data is that um, you have low DNDS of wild viruses. Um, and you can measure this in multiple ways. What I'm showing here is actually the change in comparison to the directly to the vaccine strains. And so what low DNDS is saying is that there's very few non-synonymous changes that distinguish a wild virus from a vaccine virus. Um, in contrast, if you look at the Sabin-like viruses, they tend to have pretty high, DN actually the highest DNDS. And what that means is that although their total evolutionary distance is small, as a population, the space that they explore is huge. Um, they're changing amino acids all the time, much higher frequency than wild virus. Um, and so, they're exp so when you start a vaccination, it's immediately exploring a lot of space, most of which is not the space that resembles wild polio parts. Um, and then these intermediate quantities are, you know, are in between. Um, CVDPV, which is the most wild-like, is actually the least amount of protein coding change um, from the vaccine. And the immunocompromised shedders are in between. They tend to be more um, non-synonymous changes. And what the blue one is on the type 1 is one of those alternate vaccine candidates that was a totally different place in that phylogeny, but is also safe, you know, attenuated and also has a pretty high amount of amino acid change. And so from the sort of textbook theory of DNDS and host adaptation and evolution, we sort of generically think at a gene level um, that when I'm seeing more non-synonymous change at the same time as I'm seeing adaptation to a new host environment, that's a sign of positive selection. Um, and what this data is actually showing is looked at at a genome-wide level, it's backwards. The more amino acid change I'm seeing, that's the least correlated with returning to the wild, fully transmissible, fully virulent phenotype. Um, and so it's counterintuitive from the textbook theory, and I think, it's, I think what we're learning is it's not counterintuitive if you, once you look function by function. Um, it's that looking across a whole capsid is still looking across 2,400 bases and four proteins. Um, it's the functional positions matter. Um, and as we'll talk about on the next slide, amino acid changes in some places are definitely correlated with going back towards the wild type, and in other places they're, they're not. Um, which makes, brings us to the next surprising thing, um, looking at type 1. So you think about it, it's a, va it's a virus we vaccinate against. Um, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a virus that generates a lot of, you know, life, it can generate lifetime immunity. Um, so, you, you know, if it was influenza, the story would all be about antigenic escape. It would be, hey, as well, the population gets immunity, let me change my antigenic content so that I can escape that immunity and then transmit again to the same people. Um, so what happens in polio, and I'm, I'm just zooming in on a specific antigenic site here, um, in this, which is basically this region of amino acids is known to be an antigen binding site that's pretty predictive of, of uh, immunity against poliovirus. Starting with the vaccine on the top, 
progressing through a series of genetic intermediates that we did some ancestral state reconstruction to figure out what their genotypes were like, um, grabbing some examples like another vaccine or some examples from the immunocompromised pool and so on. Um, in this antigenic site, as you progress up the virulence part of the chain, you do see some change in the amino acid that's coded for. So that is an example of a host adaptation that is probably positively selected for return to wild phenotype. But then when you get to the immunocompromised shedders, the people who do not produce antibodies against this antigenic site, they are the ones with the most antigenic variation. Um, and so when there's no immunity to escape from is what we associate actually the most variability. Um, so, I, you know, this, is a, this has been seen, I, you know, I'm doing a meta study in this. This is not my original observation, but putting it into context with the reconstruction is. Um, what we think, probably the best theory, um, is that because it's, this is a small, simple virus, um, it has, doesn't have a lot of extra bells and whistles, um, the antigenic sites are often near the receptor binding areas in the, in the canyon. And so we actually think that probably, the, at least my favorite theory is actually that it's easier to break receptor binding ability affinity than it is to deal with than it is to break immune uh, immune dynamics without re messing up your receptor binding ability, and so in the immunocompromised people where there's not a lot of pressure to clear the infection, they can actually tolerate a lower affinity poliovirus, um, whereas the people that are actually under the most immune pressure are the ones that actually have the least tolerance for a lower affinity receptor binding. Um, I can't I don't know that that's true, but that's uh, my operating theory at the moment. Um, but it again speaks to taking you know sort of what you'd naively expect and applying it and seeing that it's backwards. Um, and then yeah okay, um, got three or four more minutes. So another thing though that, to come back to something that's maybe less counterintuitive but is also really fun to think about. Um, this matters when you think about public health and viruses as a system, as an ecology, as opposed to just a single thing. Um, polio is one of a member of what are called species C enteroviruses. Um, all species C enteroviruses, all of the, the only thing that defines a polio virus is its capsid. All of the translation and transcription machinery that's not the capsid is completely promiscuous between the entire family of enteroviruses. So you can re so in, in nature, polyvirus will recombine freely with other um, other enteroviruses. And so the interesting thing that comes up for thinking about again the epidemiology is the circulating strains. Typically, most of the time that we've ever found them have recombined outside the capsid with non-polio enterovirus. Um, and that brought along a bunch of amino acid changes in those regions. Um, in contrast, the immunocompromised shedders never are seen to recombine with non-polio enteroviruses, and their amino acid changes are, are generated endogenously, are distributed much more uniformly across the genome. Um, so first, just as a classifier, they're different. Again, it speaks to them being different phenotypes and different ecology. It's interesting to think about it from like a mechanism point of view of you know, again, this is a theory now. This isn't something I've proven. Um, you know, the immunocompromised people are, their, their virus is optimizing to local persistence in that, in that host, and they are able to stay there for a long time. The other ones, the CBDPVs, are optimizing for trans, are being optimized for transmission from person to person. To do that, they're grabbing a bunch of genetic material from viruses that transmit person to person in exactly the same people, the naturally encourage, occur, occurring enteroviruses. Um, and so, it's plausible, and this has been debated for 40 years, and will probably, and it'll probably still be debated, um, that the recombination events are actually bringing with you a bunch of transmission-capable fitness components that you would lose if you just continued to evolve freely from the starting vaccine state, like you do in the immunocompromised shedders. Um, and so this is sort of what do I think we know? Um, and th maybe that title is a little more for people who are deep in the weeds on polio than somebody who this is their only exposure to. Um, but I think that there are multiple convergent evolutionary pathways that are different in different ways for different phenotypes. Um, and particularly that virulence and transmissibility are not the same thing. Uh, virulence appears to evolve first um, in human passage. 
Um, but then transmissibility versus persistence within hosts seems to go in two different directions. Um, that same phenomenon has been better documented in foot and mouth disease virus in cattle, which is a relation, relative of poliovirus. Um, and it's kind of fun to think about that this VDPV evolution violates these textbook expectations. Um, and it's probably most important for those of us who are involved in like emerging pathogen work, um, where you, know, you get a new phylogeny, you see some patterns, you ran it in beast or Raxamel or something like that, and you, you see some evolutionary patterns, but you don't have any good prior information about what the phenotype is. Um, you know, I would have concluded a bunch of things exactly backwards if I didn't know a lot about polio's epidemiology based just on the phylogeny. Um, yeah, and then again for the polio program, um, yeah, it's not simply a matter of reverting those well understood markers. Um, there's more going on as a population genetics process taking place in a transmission process. Um, and maybe that's the last part. You know, I mentioned one in a hundred million um, as like how often a vaccine dose becomes a circulating outbreak. Um, I don't think the evolution process gets us to one in a hundred million from virulence markers reverting in a week, uh, you know, in almost in, in lots of people. And so part of it is certainly that there's this evolutionary uh, competition and population genetics process. But part of it is also that, you know, there's community structure and this has to all happen through a transmitting structured complicated population. And at every given moment, you, have, you know, if you put in some infections, some type two vaccine, it only, you know, it might transmit along one, you know, from one person to the next to the next, but then those people know each other. And so the actual number of people that my evolutionary process can fight it out on is pretty small until it does it in enough different places and hops across looser social connections and eventually gets its way out. And so part of the other work we do on this question at the Institute for Disease Modeling is trying to better understand this part of it as well. Um, and we're starting to be able to inform learn more about using the surveillance, um, this stuff in polio eradication. Um, a lot of what I talked to you about today is more my favorite theoretical topics that I don't get to do a lot of applied work on. Um, but what I'm showing you here is just a, a feel for the new kinds of data we're collecting, or we, the Pakistan program um, is collecting with their, with their sewage surveillance. Um, and so every, we, every few weeks they're taking sewage samples and looking for poliovirus and they're, and they're sequencing everything they find, at least a partial genome sequence of everything they find. And what I'm showing you here is calendar time and then some measure of, and this is all vaccine, Sabin-like or vaccine-derived virus. I'm showing a measure of how many total changes there are from the vaccine reference. And this was a public health event where there was, we stopped using type 2 vaccine in April of 2016 in this region. And in November, we found multiple isolates that were all genetically linked to each other. This is a circulating vaccine-derived polio outbreak. And so in response to that, and we also have some other random detections of virus. Um, in response to this event, vaccination campaigns were done in this region of Pakistan, right by the Afghanistan border, and Kandahar is over here. Um, is, uh, Karachi is, is down here. Um, and we see a flurry of polioviruses in the sewers from the probably hundreds of thousands of children that were vaccinated, um, rapidly evolving in different directions, um, changing geographic locations, which is interesting. This is the vaccine transmitting. Um, continues on, the next campaign comes in, starts the process over. At the end of this process, we did detect a linked sample, and we detected a couple outliers, and at this point we never saw it again. But throughout this entire process, there's a bunch of evidence about the population genetics process that leads to these linked isolates. Um, and particularly, some of what we saw with this uh, synonymous, non-synonymous, et cetera, is although this was linked, the amino acid distribution of these guys is very different than this one. Um, and so one of the things I think that we think we're learning is actually to be able to classify high and low, high risk versus low risk Tran, you know, viruses that appear to be transmitting for the future prediction of the program. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, stop there. There's a lot of things we can do to take a bunch of the theory work I told you and the basic bioinformatics work and to try to test various pieces of it. Um, you know, combinations of tissue culture stuff, better analysis of field studies, um, some cool stuff that I'm, I think we're going to get started pretty soon with human intestinal organoids, which are still like a kind of like an in vitro model system, but also kind of like a 3D human tissue. Um, yeah, and I'll just leave up my uh, collaborators that, uh, you know, various points of my career on this work have been important. So, thank you.
fascinated by this idea of like all these viruses floating around each other, we combine with other viruses. So uh, do you think we would be able to learn more if we were in the sequence of like all the RNA viruses floating in a cell and trying to build a model based on that? Like we can just pull from these viruses and see, oh, that's too much or is I super think it would be useful. It'd be interesting. Um, where I where I work and, and particularly working on polio, there's you, we're tied. It's epidemiology first. Um, there's experimental virology work that still goes on that is all about usually not competing like the whole virome, um, but about like the deep sequencing and the diversity um, that is very interesting. I definitely think it would be interesting to better understand how this works, particularly if we were think if we were still in a situation where we were trying to come up with new interventions. Um, you know, is there, would we, would we be able to target an antiviral better if we actually understood that process better, I think is a very interesting question. Um, if you're interested in it though, I, I suggest directing you to a different virus that is not hopefully going to be eradicated soon. <laughs> Uh, good question. Yeah, so um, when I say outbreak, in, I almost always mean ca uh, cases. Um, in polio, because we're so close to eradication, you know, one or two cases is sufficient to classify as an outbreak. Um, one is because there's not supposed to be any virus anywhere, and two, it goes back to that case to infection question where if I see a case, particularly for type 2, particularly for vaccine derived where it may not be back to full phenotype, that might mean thousands of infections. Um, and so from that point of view, epidemiologically, it's, uh, it should be treated as an outbreak. This example, I believe, is two paralytic cases and a bunch of sewage samples. And the vast majority of this is sewage samples. Um, but the vast majority of this, a year and a half, two years ago, we, we couldn't see. Um, and yeah, and so, and, and I don't think we should, this is actually the vaccine working um, in its own way. Yeah. So, you know, the uh, anti-vaccination campaign, are we possibly to see reemergence of polio? Wasn't that something in the past few years about reemergence of cases in the U.S.? Mm-hmm. That's a really good question. Um, it's pretty so it is probably possible. Um, you know, a, a different talk um, is the interaction of sanitation and transmission. Um, that was, again, a bit of what we talked about earlier today. Um, I do not think it, so it, it's probably not easy. Um, but, for example, in the U.S. in 2008, um, an Amish community Experience is one actually one of these vaccine derived things I talked about was in an Amish community in the US. Um, it's actually not known how it got to them, um, but then it transmitted among a, a half a dozen families. Um, prior to that, in the 70s, a similar thing happened that went from three states in the US and Ontario. Um, that was local vaccine refusal allowing transmission after reimportation. Um, that, fe that phenomenon is probably the number one reason that Afghanistan still has polio. Um, is people not vaccinating for various, mostly political reasons. Um, yeah, but we do have the help of the higher the sanitation is, the harder it is. Um, and so I, I don't think it's, it's deterministic. And that's maybe, you know, me, like contrast with measles. Um, in northern India, measles and polio are probably roughly equally infectious. That's the evidence we have. Very, very, you know, are not of 30. Um, but Whereas measles, it's not really strongly a feature of anything because it's just aerosol and you could show up in a room two hours later and still get it. With polio, there's a strong sanitation component to it and that, that helps. Um, but it's probably not enough to stop it. 